from day one, people know that if we have to grow in this company, uh, you know, we need to adhere to the values and we need to live the values. And they're all universal values. Managers know that the only way they can grow is to build a very strong team uh, that is performing very well. And but I would advise all entrepreneurs to say that if you, if, you, if you choose to do it the right way, the right way is not the easy way. The people are all across the people are looking for the short term. Alrighty, hello everyone and welcome to the Deal Maker Show. So today, very exciting guest, uh, definitely joining us here from India and the uh, incredible journey, remarkable journey. You know, it goes from being in the military to going to the US, to going back to India, to doing corporate, to doing startups. And now he definitely has something very unique with Jumbo Tell that he's going to be telling us about. So I guess without further ado, let's welcome our guest today. So let's say hello to Karthik. Ben Kateswaran, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much for having me in the show. Uh, I'm very excited to share my experiences uh, to, your, to your audience. So you were born and raised there in India, in the southern part, and you were born in a family that was uh, part of, you know, they had functions uh, in the government. So, so how was life growing up there? It's very slow, very slow, low tech. And uh, lots of uh, lots of family and uh, very very deep bonds and network and very close to the ground. Well, I and can imagine. Are, and yeah. what about what about in your town? I mean, was there a lot of entrepreneurs, or or were there like all for the most part workers? No, my town is called Temple Town. It's a tourist location. India, it's one. Of, it, it 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 has a fascinating temple called Minakshi Temple, uh, which uh, was once a contender for seven wonders of the world. And uh, it's it's a it's a fascinating place. A lot of foreign tourists come there. Uh, I grew up there in the town. Not not many entrepreneurs. But hey, India is a land of entrepreneurs. So it India has like fifty million small and medium businesses operating. So quite literally, everybody is an entrepreneur. So hundred percent. And I think there's like yeah. one point three billion people there. So I mean, talking about a machine of entrepreneurs. You know, one of the things that I really like about uh, India is that there is a lot of. Um, you know, there's a big push towards engineering. And, you know, many of the people that come out of um, India, you know, and especially the people that I have interviewed that in, end up being founders is that they have that engineering mindset of knowing how to resolve problems already. So so why is there so many engineers there in India? Uh, you know, people are always looking to upgrade their lives. And India, India has always invested in math and science. If you look at it, in 1947, we got independence from the British. But we, uh, despite our poor population, we invested in space, we invested in atomic energy, we invested in science. And India is actually, if you look back at the history, India, it zero was invented in India. There are a lot of, you know, rich traditions and, and a deep uh, cultural background of uh, education. So people started investing again. And human resources is all what we had. And we, we our focus, like, especially for me, my parents also want me to go and join engineering. I, in fact, actually went and joined an engineering school. I dropped out of engineering and then I went to the military. So I was very clear as to, you know, what kind of life I needed to, you know, uh, pursue. I wanted to be a more purposeful life, a life that serves my country. And therefore, uh, I thought that a better opportunity would be to go to the military. But many, many of my uh, schoolmates, they all went into engineering as a career choice. That's what I wanted to ask you, actually. So, so in your case, you you did go the engineering route, and uh, you ended up dropping out, and you joined the military, the infantry, and I mean that was like a ten-year uh, journey. I mean, it's uh, talking about you know lots of stuff that you can do while you are in the army, but I'm sure that you were exposed to uh, circumstances full of uncertainty, uh, circumstances where maybe they were not as pleasant. Uh, and, and really building startups is like going to work. So I guess that to a certain degree, you were able to experience, you know, the whole, you know, feeling and emotions that you go through with a startup, but probably at a different level in the army. I, I, can, I don't know. I, I, I've never attempted to compare a startup life uh, with a military life, but there are some things uh, that come uh, very deeply uh, connected is the mission orientedness. In both the places, we are very mission-oriented. A startup entrepreneur is very deeply mission-driven and mission-oriented. And the second aspect is a sur survival. So you have always, you are living in that world of, you know, uh, your, sur your survival is not guaranteed. 
So you, and it, it imposes a lot of cognitive dissonance in your mind and you need to be able to live and take decisions very calmly during that environment. And I you know both the, both the places and, and, uh, and of course, uh, the, the, uh, the, the easier, if you, if you go into the nitty gritties, obviously military is a very hierarchical uh, organization, which is like, you know, hundreds of years old and very set way of doing things. And startup is like a lot of, you know, independence. But ultimately, I think the sense of accomplishing what you set out to achieve the mission, I think that that sense for me was same. So what does it mean when you are mission oriented, especially for the people that are that are listening? You know, there's many, many founders that, you know, are, are maybe thinking like, hey, you know, I, I'd love to to know what that mission oriented, you know, means so that maybe I can implement it to my own you know, journey. So what does it look like to be mission oriented? So as an entrepreneur, uh, uh, if you, if you, there are many different ways in which people arrive at entrepreneurship. I am one of those people who uh, had a very, very specific problem to solve that I, I was deeply connected with, that I considered as, as my calling. I, I, I thought that I am specifically um, capable of solving this very hard problem. And therefore, I started to, started, uh, I chose to solve this problem. So solving that problem uh, and you know it becomes the becomes a very uh, a goal uh, that becomes a very life purpose uh, and when you solve that problem the goodness that it brings to the society the transformative ways in which the societies can live differently that becomes your mission every single day you have that five year ahead of time you already thought about what that life should look like and you're painting that and you're creating that and that is the sense of um, you know, purpose and the vision that I have. So you already have a way, you already have a future picture of the world as picture of success that you think in the most benevolent way is right for this world. And then you are steadfastly creating that, persevering, enduring, uh, finding all ways and means to make that happen, your goal. And you are willing to sacrifice everything, everything, you know, in, in pursuit of that goal. Got it. So in your case, you were for 10 years in the army, obviously tons of experiences. But one thing that is super interesting is that you land in Stanford. So how do you land in Stanford, you know, doing your MBA coming <laughs> from 10 years in the army? That's just such like a weird transition. So so can you walk <laughs> us through what happened there? I, I was posted in, in, in Kashmir Valley and I got into Silicon Valley and divine indulgence is the only term I have. I can't explain. I, I really don't know how to explain this. Uh, but the genesis of that was um, I gave my 10 best years uh, uh, for, for, uh, for fighting, uh, but I, I was deployed in hard combat. But I quickly realized that, um, you know, the most powerful nations are the ones that are economically very prosperous. The people actually you end up doing the last mile fighting is actually, you know, if you're economically sound, no one dare attack you, no one dare touch you, right? That is the level in which I saw my country. I want my country to be in that level, that you are economically prosperous, your people are very prosperous, you are having a very important uh, strategic location in, 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 in the geopolitical, you know, canvas. Um, to that end, I think, you know, 1.3 billion people at that time, about a billion people in the country, uh, consuming food, which is at a very, very subsistence level, Farming was a very large part of our GDP uh, and also 52% of our population involved in farming. It was all you know, done very, very inefficiently. So I thought that I should spend the remaining part of my life transforming the food value chain in the country. So um, way back in 2008, 2009, I was prototyping a, 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 a platform called Kisango.com connecting uh, the uh, farmers, coconut farmers of my uh, zone uh, to distant buyers through an SMS-based platform. So Nokia N70 was the uh, smartest phone then. But I quickly realized that this isn't about just connecting two sides of the platform. Sure, asymmetry of information was you know rampant. But how do you ship the goods if you get the order? How do you collect the cash in a cash economy? Right? How the seller gets the money back? So the problem was way too big. And I, as a person who spent like 10 years in the military and four years in the military academy, I was not equipped to solve the problem. I didn't know how to run business. Uh, I, only ha I, I only had the passion. I neither had the talent uh, and nor the market was ready. So now I wanted to reskill myself and then I applied to business school and I luckily got into Stanford. I, I don't I mean, know much beyond that. 
Wow, I mean, I, I, I wonder, you know, like probably the people reviewing your application was like, wow, this is definitely unique, eh, to say to say the least, eh, because 10 years in the Army is amazing. So, so incredible transition here, pivotal moment for you, uh, and also you get to meet your co-founder. So it doesn't get better Perfect. than that. So, so how was that, you know, um, you guys meeting, uh, and perhaps, you know, that process of, because it took some time, you know, until you guys actually launched uh, Jumbo Tail. I mean, you went to eBay, then you did Flipkart, and then you finally, you know, got started with the business. Uh, but what, what was that? What was that like? I mean, did you guys meet and then, you know, eventually later on you gave him a call or you guys met, you knew you were going to do this, but it was just waiting for the right time. Uh, no, during the school time, we just know that we both are uh, uh, connected. So Ashish, uh, let me just uh, spend uh, a minute in his, about his background. So uh, he's a professional farmer. So his entire family does farming for a living. Uh, they have apple farms. And then uh, he went to one of the top uh, engineering schools in the country, IIT Delhi. And after that, he went to uh, you know, BCG. He was a consultant in BCG for six years, four years prior to business school and two years after business school. And during his six years, um, um, he worked on projects for the government of India for streamlining the public distribution system, which is a food procurement uh, arm of the, uh, of the government. So these people procure a lot of food from the farmers and then store it for food security. And then they have their own 500,000 retail outlets, the government retail outlets, through which they supply these food on a subsidy to the end consumer. And there were a lot of leakages and there were a lot of you know black market and the government wanted to prevent this. So they commissioned, uh, along with World Food Program, they commissioned BCG to find a solution to this. And Ashish worked on projects that eventually led to the biometric identification of every citizen in the country. And uh, that's today the backbone of the social security system of the country. So he comes from that level of background. Not only is a farmer, but he's also spent a lot of time working on these projects. So when I came to know, uh, we were always talking. But yes, uh, for about a good three years, uh, we were not actually specifically discussing many ideas. When I came back to India, I was you know quite ready because I was very systematically uh, uh, progressing towards my goal. And Ashish was doing the same thing with his set of you know, farmers and trying to aggregate his farmer network and everything. So in one of the third colleague's wedding, you know, one of a classmate's wedding in Delhi, uh, Prague Jain, um, we met and then we bounced off this idea. And then, hey, we have spent this much of time. And this is, and at that time, I had a very concrete idea. So I pitched to okay. him and then he joined us. And you got obviously so, um, a concrete idea that was uh, shaped up too with your experiences because you were working in the US, you know, at eBay, um, you know, obviously amazing company, great, great company. And then you did Flipkart. So I guess before we go into Jumbo Tell, I like to understand what did you learn? You know, what was the biggest lesson that you learned from your time at uh, eBay? Because this was your first exposure, like real working exposure to the American culture. Uh, then, you know, I like to understand why you go from being in the U.S., you know, the land of opportunity, the American dream, to going back to India. You know, I'm sure your parents were like, hey, Kartik, what, what's wrong with you, right? So, so, so <laughs> walk us through that lesson learned or, or what you really got from being at eBay and why you make the decision of going back to India, which obviously now everything worked out very well. And, you know, it's amazing what you've done. But. Perhaps some people thought that you were taking a step backwards. So, so go ahead. So, um, uh, to be honest, I already knew Jumbo Tail was in my mind when I came to even Stanford. So, I did not come to uh, US uh, and get a Stanford. I came to US for a short period of time to learn the superset so that I can go and solve the subset problems. I believe that that will give me the diversity, the network, and uh, that will give me the exposure. And that is why I chose eBay, uh, which is the most complex marketplace. Uh, and, you know, I learned what to me eBay was a university, uh, a university that was paying me, uh, you know, to learn uh, how to build e-commerce marketplaces. Uh, I'm, you know, I can't be more thankful to my colleagues and uh, in the company itself for giving me all the opportunities. I worked on very complex problems, but uh, most importantly, you're right. I started learning how to work in corporate environments, uh, how these organizational designs and set up and all of these things work. But of all the things that actually eBay taught me was uh, data-driven product management. So I was a product manager there. And uh, the ability to, uh, what was very fascinating to me was that, you know, eBay measured everything. And it had, the, it had a way to, you know, democratize the data, 
and it was all accessible to people and uh, it it was a land of you know opportunity even within the company if you really really want to improve the system and and grow your products on and things so i learned how to do data driven product management i learned how to work with um, very very highly talented engineers at one point i was the product manager for search trend and applied research so i was working with like nearly you know seven eight post doctoral fellows uh, from various top universities across the us uh, and they were all solving very hard problems and ebay was particularly attractive to them because they got a lot of data to work on real world data so they were very attracted to ebay so i got an opportunity to work with them so i learned a ton of stuff there uh, what an evolved marketplace is that is number one second one is particularly i was fortunate to serve under uh, mr john donaho uh, who is again a stanford gsb alumni and uh, he had come and taken over ebay and he was transitioning ebay from quite literally non relevant you know irrelevant company to a very very highly relevant company at that particular point in time and one thing that actually changed the culture of the ebay was ebay was a very seller focused marketplace it was focused very much on the seller side of the ecosystem they focus on the supply they never really bothered about customers before mr john donaho so once the mobile came and then the whole focus shifted on the customer and i learned that if you focus on customer experience and get it right everything else falls in place if you are paying ebay who is the paying customer for ebay the sellers they pay the commissions now ebay was heavily focused on them and now the customers if you don't have the end consumers if you don't care for them if you don't solve for trust if you don't solve for high repeat experience if you you know even don't bother to present your own identity to the consumers in a very clear concise recons- recallable manner then you have no business so these are two very solid uh, learnings that i had from from ebay got it so then why going to india because i have to build uh, for the indian food ecosystem that's what i came actually one of the interviews in ebay uh, today uh, you know she is a vice president in google uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, I uh, I that entire interview was about my idea that I will do after 3 years. Got I told it. in the interview that 3 years I will work here and then I want to go back. So I was you, very as transparent as that. So you basically had a vision, uh you knew what you wanted to do. So you kind of like reverse back engineer and understood, hey, I'm going to need to get this knowledge, this know-how. So then essentially you go back to India, you start working at Flipkart, you go there for like maybe like a year and a half and then There I guess you had the exposure of being part of building that marketplace you know being part of a rocket ship doing a lot of hires at what point in time would you say it was that moment that pushed you over the edge to say I got to start Jumbo Hotel it's now is the right time for this yeah so 2014 was a particularly uh, you know uh, explosive year for indian venture capital if you actually look at 2014 2015 like hundreds of millions of dollars were being invested in e-commerce companies so um, grocery was one such sector that was receiving hundreds of millions of dollars and uh, the sector that uh, you know it was about directly uh, you know shipping an amazon model to the end consumer right that was people were investing in chasing and flipkart also started a service called nearby so flipkart nearby and uh, i was uh, you know watching that uh, performance uh, you know quite closely and i was from day one convinced that um the way to solve indian grocery is not directly go to the consumer yes you will probably have a 1% 2% market share but uh, the 98% of the market is still going to be with the mom and pop universe and it's going to be very large and they are consumer scale uh, businesses so uh, they think and act like consumers in many form but yet they are running their businesses and we need to provide a solution for them so i was looking at it um and then uh, it's a question of then timing so uh, like uh, you know what they say in y combinator i think paul graham says you know paint a picture 5 years from now think about what the world should look like what is missing so i was very clear that 5 uh, years from now there should be a robust b2b e-commerce platform in the country uh, which is serving these mom and pop universe and um, uh, what was missing actually at that point in time i asked them why people are not building for it is because they were too busy building for consumers that's number one second is ideologically they were connected to the idea that you know these small businesses will be wiped out and uh, and us uh, kind of you know amazon you know large corporations will per- survive i didn't subscribe to that i was fundamentally believing that nobody can wipe out the small businesses and uh, the third part is people were just too 
you know, not so perseverant to actually find a solution for uh, internet laggards. If you actually look at the mom and pop st uh, store people, right, at that particular point in time, they're not having the smartphones. They didn't even have the internet connection. India didn't have 4G at that time. Reliance Geo had not come. So over a period of time, you know, it, I, I thought that we just have to time it well. So the bets that we took, Ashish and I took at that point in time was um, 4G is going to come and India will skip 3G. This is one. Bang on. It worked for us. And it all worked for us in times. Again, divide intelligence. You know, we just got the timing right. Second one is we said that, you know, smartphone adoption could be a challenge. Maybe, you know, a $100 smartphone may not be possible or a $50 smartphone may not be possible. In the worst case scenario, we may give a device. At that time, we were thinking that way. But smartphone adoption also became very, very prevalent and people just started buying their own devices. So these two problems got solved. Then the third problem is how do we make this semi-literate, illiterate population to use a computer device? So then I went back to my army roots. So I served in the army and I, I served in the infantry and majority, I, I actually served in Gorkha troop. So my, my people used to come from Nepal, all of my soldiers and, you know, deep parts of your villages, right? An army has these, all these complex gadgets and uh, quite literally very, very complex gadgets, even GPS, navigation, all of these things are used by these semi-literate, illiterate people. And I had been an instructor in infantry school training them. So I was very accustomed to this set of population. And I knew that if you build it right, you'll be able to solve the problem. And uh, nobody was even building for them. So we said that we're going to build something that works for them. So these are the India's truly next billion from a user experience perspective. And till date, let me tell you, I mean, I know you said there should not be any selfie shots here. Uh, we don't have a sales force. We are serving 25, uh, you know, 30,000 mom and pop retailers without a sales force. They... 100% of our orders come from the app. They self-initiate it. They open the app, they order it. We have completely eliminated the cost of Salesforce just by building for them. Like wow. what works for them? What do they think? We are method actors. We call ourselves as method actors. We live the life of the mom and pops Kirana stores. And then we think for them and we build them and we've largely succeeded there. So then, so then how do you guys make money? Karthik, how do you guys make money at Jumbo Tail? So we have multiple revenue streams. So first of all, it's a marketplace. So, uh, for, so first of all, what is Jumbo Tail? Jumbo Tail is a, a, a wholesale e-commerce platform serving these small mom and pop stores, thousands of them. And then we also have a new retail platform that transforms the mom and pop uh, uh, stores into modern stores called J24 stores. So J24 stores could be your 7-Elevens uh, found across. So we go to these existing traditional stores and transform them uh, using our brand, our technology, our supply chain and training and multiple other you know layered services so we make money uh, with the mom and pop stores when they source from us uh, we get a commission from the sellers like a typical ebay amazon model so third party sellers provide commission if there is something that is flowing through the um, uh, you know if you, if you have an inventory model uh, there, there are some markups so there are different uh, uh, you know source of revenue in that transaction second is the shipping so we also have a full fledged logistics service so we have a company called jumbo day logistics so we provide logistics services, fulfillment centers. We run large fulfillment centers. We run large distribution centers and we do the storefront delivery. So the mom and pops pay for shipping. Then we have a fintech platform. So the fintech platform connects non-bank and new banks to these mom and pops for lending. So there, there is a uh, interest uh, arbitrage. So what's our cost of capital uh, through that is actually the mom and pops actually paying more than that actually through the cost of capital, but they're paying far less than their actual cost of capital outside of the platform. So there's an arbitrage. And finally, the retail services. So for the J24 stores, we provide a lot of services, technology, uh, loyalty programs and stuff. So for that, we get a share of the retail sales. So that's a, you can equate to a franchisee model. So these are the four revenue streams we have. Got it. Uh, and in this case, how much capital have you guys raised to date? Uh, we have raised about $54 million Got so it. far. We recently completed our uh, $25 million round, uh, $25 million across two rounds in uh, in December. And I'm sure there's been a lot of creativity to make that happen because here you are, you know, pushing a, quite a unique uh, business model. Also, uh, perhaps going up against a uh, big, big giant. So, you know, it probably took a, a, a lot of belief to really invest in, in Jumbo Tail. So how do you go about that? So, see, fortunately, I think, you know, um, uh, yeah, the business model that one we have chosen is one of 
sustainable scale and profitability so we are very proud to say uh, you know we are uh, we are operationally profitable company and you know we don't we don't discount we don't sell below cost uh, to gain traction we have not chosen any such path and we are we are growing organically and uh, this has uh, you know introduced two uh, parameters so first of all the color of the money so what kind of investors you end up attracting if you choose profitability over scale uh, early on right we want to be perfect we wanted to make sure that you know we get our model right in one one uh, zone of the country because it's like a 500 billion dollar market uh, you know you can always fake growth and get to billions of dollars and by losing hundreds of millions of dollars right that's not what we wanted to do and i have personally seen this journey in flipkart so flipkart would raise like billion dollars give a lot of discount and then grow and the cycle continues right somebody else comes and pays up for a higher valuation because you have a higher gmv this is not what i wanted to build because ultimately that company would sell and i want to go ipo and i want to you know we want to build as a, you know as founders as this company we want we are looking at a 100 year enduring company and that is exactly you know what our mission vision was so therefore we focused on profitability from day one doing it right and really knowing whether whatever we are building is being valued by the user or not and or is he coming to us for the discounts we are offering him so that was very important to us that feedback was very important to us so when you make those choices then you also make the choices for the kind of you know capital that you end up uh, uh, you know attracting right so that is number one the second one is that uh, obviously uh, this is a very large market where everybody so reliance is there uh, which is a very large company uh, you know india's largest retail company uh, amazon walmart uh, now there are a few other worthy competitors on the startup space all having raised hundreds of million of dollars or you know everybody is trying to do and here we are building the right way now how do you convince you know uh, uh, large people that we won't get wiped out people have to simply trust right so we have the trust we always we never doubted ourselves but then you, uh, you, you if you if you go to these fund managers like people who are managing somebody else's money they're not going to take the risk if they think that you know somebody else can always build it like what if google builds what if amazon builds if that is the question and you know we are a very highly execution oriented business and we are we were very specifically looking for investors who are prior entrepreneurs who understand what it takes to build this business who truly inherently get the moat when you have a physical relationship with your retail customers through a supply chain through fintech through tens of relationships it's so hard to build the moat is very defensible today i'm very proud to say one more selfie shot here we have the highest customer nps in the segment period and we have raised 120th of the dollar that other people have raised or deployed we have the highest customer segment nps this is not my job my uh, survey this some third party somebody else did the research and they published it uh, in in the ecosystem right so i am we we invest in that so that is exactly what we ended up doing so our fundraising journey has been one of uh raising uh through alternative models of capital so we have uh, a, an extremely you know good set of institutional backers both venture capitalists but for our series b uh, uh you know we had uh, you know investors from you know us and canada uh, we have a, a, a and you know we we raise funds from family offices uh, you know who have actually built these businesses and today we have investors from 11 countries and uh, from australia uh, to south america to us canada germany Uh, and all of them uh, have a, a very uh, you know a big faith in the execution power that we have and these people are not afraid about hey what if amazon builds tomorrow and i'm sure that the the distinct culture that you guys have you know has contributed to this so so tell us about the culture you know how you've gone about you know putting the culture together for jumbo tail what that looks like and what are the three let's say the three key factors or the three key fundamentals behind jumbo tail's culture So uh, right from day one, we were uh, very clear about uh, building a very values-driven organization. So we enunciated 15 core values, and we published it. Um, and uh, we we hire for those values, we retain for those values, promote for those values. One of the unique things about uh, our company, our startup, is the appraisal system. So um, we have people rating each other only on adherence to values, and peers rate each other. uh what are the values that they adhere what are the values that they write like business school type essays and um people are uh, 80% of the rating of a people is peer and ps on my experience working with my peer how likely am i to recommend jumbo tail to my networks and colleagues and that is the only parameter that we have 
we do not have an appraisal system based on uh, targets and results. Uh, the only thing that we care about is uh, do people uh, subscribe to the value system. Uh, and every everybody knows. And, and the second one that we actually changed uh, was that uh, for managers, you know, when you uh, so when you when a manager is rated uh, again, only 20 percent uh, uh, is, is rating from his manager. The remaining 80 percent is coming from um, a combination of their direct reports performance. And why it is important is because as a manager, you are a function of your direct reports. You know, it's, it's impossible. It should be impossible that you, all of your direct reports are average and you are outstanding. There's something very wrong. Right. So therefore, your rating by force is an average rating of your uh, your direct reports. And then uh, what your peers feel about you, what your managers at every step, what your managers thinks about you is not a question at all. It carries a 20 percent weight. It's a, it's a ceremonial weight. And therefore, from day one, people know that if we have to grow in this company, uh, you know, we need to adhere to the values and we need to live the values. And they're all universal values. You know, it's like being customer fanatic or think long term, some kind of universal values. And there are 15 of them. And second one is managers know that the only way they can grow is to build a very strong team uh, that is performing very well and uh, they are rated very well. So therefore, we wanted to just set this entire culture missionary into one that is supported by an institutional system of performance management, institutionalizing a performance management system um, that values what we want to eventually stand for. Uh, and, and it's not like something that we wrote and we set out. This ended up helping us hiring, you know, true missionaries, people who can withstand competition. Again, um, people who don't piss in their pants when somebody raises like $100 million because, you know, the customer is on our side. We are doing it right for the customer. We are making money. We are profitable. Why should we bother? Okay, no, yeah. you know, we are in one city. We'll go to 10 cities. It's a very large and we have taken a 20-year view of the market, not the five-year view that a venture capitalist would take. So in that way, I think we are building a very, very strong company. So I, I, you know, it's amazing, you know, like how, um, how laser focused and driven, you know, you are and, and, you know, I'm sure that that's a, you know, a great thing that the company is getting influenced by, uh, because ultimately the founders, you know, are the ones that, that establish the, that culture, no, and then people take it and, and run. So, so I guess if I was to put you into a time machine, Karthik, and I bring you back in time, I bring you back to perhaps, you know, you're in Stanford and maybe thinking about that world, how that world is going to look like in five years and maybe like build something and even perhaps launching a business. If you were able to talk to your younger self and give your younger self one piece, one single piece of advice before launching a business, what would that be and why, given what you know now? Well, that's two questions, right? What is the... So just what, one, the one piece... Idea? One piece of advice that you could give to your younger self before launching a business, if you could talk to your younger self, what would that be and why, given what you know now? Mm. I think to some extent, um, follow the money. It'll be easier. Staying too ideal. Staying too ideal and, and, and you're not following the money. A $500 billion company can get built, but then you need that equivalent amount of perseverance. So uh, I would, you know, it's not that I don't have the perseverance, but I would advise all entrepreneurs to say that if you, if you, if you choose to do it the right way, the right way is not the easy way. The people are all across the people are looking for the shortcut. Your investor is looking for the next fool who's going to come and, you know, uh, get your bailout. you out. So you need to choose the right investor. It's not easy. Right. Your, 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 your employees looking for a quick buck and, you know, it's always easy to hire that engineer who can join tomorrow, who is not like cultural fit, but who can build you that stuff. It's always, you know, uh, fall for that, you know, short term uh, discounting game to show your GMV and your revenue. But if you want to build the right thing, it's going to, you know, take a, you know, a long time and then the perseverance, uh, you know, matters there, but then, uh, you, you 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 choose the right money and you follow the money and i don't know whether i articulated it well or not because i was already following this i mean i'm not going to give any different advice to myself but i would i would still say that if there is any different advice i need to give to myself you know for 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 the uh, for majority of the ecosystem and the company the scale matters right so if you if anything that is fast scaling anything you know that is sexy 
so if if you if you want short term success then you know fast scaling stuff uh, you know needs you have to figure out a way to you know get there i love it so karthik for the people that are listening what is the best way for them to reach out and say hi uh, my email <laughs> i don't know my email could be not the best way because you know, I, i don't know i think probably my email is the best way so what's your email uh, karthik at uh, the rate jumbotail.com Amazing. Well, Karthik, thank you so much for being on the Deal Maker Show today. Thank you very much. Thanks for giving me this opportunity, and thanks a lot for all the listeners.